hello my dear students uh, today inshallah we're going to start chapter 7 which is about the motivation concept Uh, motivation uh, is the process uh, that is uh, about the individual uh, intensity, direction, and persistence of the effort toward attaining the goal, which means that uh, how the person um, uh, or the amount of effort the person put uh, to meet his goals uh, and whether that effort is in the direction of uh, achieving that goal and how long uh, is uh, someone uh, able to exert that effort in order to achieve that goal. This is the process of motivation. So it's about three things. The intensity, intensity which means uh, the amount of effort put uh, in order to meet the goal, direction, whether the effort is put in the right direction in order to achieve that goal, and the persistence, which is the duration or the how long it will take to uh, 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 achieve that goal. Uh, the level of motivation uh, varies from one person to another um, uh, and uh, within individuals at different times. And sometimes uh, the same person uh, is motivated and other times he is not as much as motivated as uh, before. So it varies between one person and another and the same person from one time to other times. It depends on uh, his mood and about the situation and about the things that uh, motivate him, okay? Uh, as we said, we there are three uh, key elements uh, of motivation, which are uh, intensity. Intensity is concerned with how hard a person tries. Uh, it is the amount of effort the one puts in order to meet the goals uh, that he won't reach. The second one is the direction. The direction is the orientation that benefits the organization. Uh, they are channeled toward the organization goals or the, um, uh, the, the effort put towards achieving that goals or not. And third is the persistence. Persistence is a measure of how long a person can maintain his or her effort, the duration uh, of uh, putting that effort in order to achieve uh, the goals uh, that one wants to reach. Uh, here we want to compare the early theories of motivation. Actually, uh, we're going to discuss uh, in this chapter uh, three uh, theories of motivation. The first is Maslow hierarchy of needs. Second is uh, Herzberg two-factor motivation hygiene theory. And uh, the last one is Macklin's uh, theory of needs, the three needs theory. You're not supposed to memorize the name of the um, scientist, just memorize the name of the theory itself. So it's hierarchy of needs, two-factor motivation hygiene theory, and the third one is the theory of needs, three needs theory. Don't memorize the name of the scientist, just know them for your uh, knowledge. The first one, which is the hierarchy of needs uh, theory by Maslow, uh, it has received uh, wide recognition uh, among uh, uh, managers inside the organization because it is uh, a logical theory and it is uh, very easy to understand and uh, some research has validated it. Uh, but however, uh, most research does not and it has been frequently researched since the 60s until now there are the, there is some questioning about its validity but still it has wide recognition all over the world. The first one, which is hierarchy of needs theory by Maslow. Uh, Maslow uh, put the needs of uh, any person uh, in hierarchy form, uh, and he stated that um, uh, anyone uh, has a, a hierarchy of needs. It starts by the physiolog physiological needs. If you uh, uh, fulfill the physiological needs, you're going to move from the physiological needs and you are going to move to the next stage, which is the safety and security needs. If you are going to fulfill your safety and security needs, you can move go on to the next level, which is the social belongingness. If you fulfill the social and belongingness needs, you're going to move to the esteem needs. If you fulfill the esteem needs, you're going to go to the top of the pyramid, which is the self-actualization. 
uh, Maslow uh, stated that individuals cannot move to the next higher level until all the needs at the current lower level are satisfied. So we must move uh, in a hierarchy order. Uh, uh, he said that um, in order to motivate someone, you have to motivate him in the level that uh, he or she uh, has a need. You cannot uh, motivate someone in a higher level unless uh, he has uh, all uh, the satisfaction he needs in the lower level. Let's uh, see in the next uh, slide what is meant by each one of these needs. Uh, as we said, uh, according to Maslow, uh, there is a hierarchy of five needs. It starts with the physiological needs, uh, which includes uh, hunger, thirst, shelter, and other bodily needs. Uh, when the person uh, fulfills those needs, uh, he or she uh, moves to the next level of needs. The next level, which is the safety needs, it includes uh, security and protection from uh, any harm, uh, either uh, physical or emotional harm. So uh, any one of us uh, think about it. First, we have to make sure that uh, we have all our physiological needs. We, we are not hungry, we are not thirsty, we have the shelter, we have everything that our body needs. After that, we have to make sure that we are safe, we are secure, we are protected from any harm, either uh, physical harm or any emotional harm that uh, might uh, affect our body. Then after uh, fulfilling those needs, uh, the person starts to uh, think about the next level of needs, which is the, so the social needs. Social needs includes affection. Affection means the, means the emotions, emotional part, uh, the belongingness, uh, to belong to uh, a group of people or to belong to a family or friends or belongingness to uh, 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 someone or a group, uh, acceptance by, uh, to be accepted by people uh, uh, or to be accepted uh, uh, by the, the community and friendship. You, you need to be socially uh, uh, having uh, friends. Uh, you have to be accepted uh, in the community you're living in. You have to have some relations with other people. You have to feel that you belong to a group of people. So these are the social needs. After uh, fulfilling those needs, uh, the person starts to uh, move on to the next level of needs, which is the higher, uh, higher one, which is the esteem needs. The esteem, which means taqdeer, the, the person needs to, to feel that he is, um, uh, people uh, 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 feels that he is important. Uh, it includes internal esteem factors such as self-respect, uh, autonomy. It, autonomy means that he is the one who uh, controls himself and achievement, he achieves something. And external esteem such as status, recognition and attention uh, in the community. So uh, uh, people want to feel that um, they are respected by other people, that uh, they are uh, achieving something, that they can control their own work. Uh, this is on the internal basis. On the external pay basis, they are recognized in their community. Uh, people pay attention to them. They have their own status. Uh, so this is the esteem needs. After fulfilling these needs, people uh, go to the highest level in the hierarchy, which the self-actualization. This is the drive to become the maximum things a person is capable of becoming. It includes the growth, achieving uh, your potential, the maximum that you can achieve, and uh, it is the self-fulfillment. Yani you achieve what, the maximum yet that you can reach. So uh, anyone, if you want to motivate a person, motivate him on the level that uh, he or she needs. If someone is in the level of the safety needs, don't motivate him with the esteem needs. He will not look at that. Think with me. If you have a very, very, very poor person, that person don't have even money to feed his children. And I'm going to tell him, oh, if you perform well on your work this week, I'm going to put your name on the wall and tell everyone that you are a very, very good uh, employee. Do you think that 
the esteem needs here is a good motivation for that man who doesn't have money to feed his children no that money needs the physi physiological needs so if you want to motivate him motivate him according to the needs he wants so maslow here said that if you want to motivate any person you have first to know which needs he wants according to the hierarchy of needs and give him the correct motivation according to the needs he wants okay uh, maslow separated uh, the five needs into uh, higher order needs and uh, lower order needs uh, the lower order needs are the physiological and safety and the higher order needs are uh, esteem and self-actualization uh, as the need becomes uh, substantially satisfied uh, the next need becomes dominant so you don't move to a need unless you uh, satisfy the uh, lower one uh, but you have to know that um, no need is ever fully uh, gratified uh, uh, but uh, a substantially satisfied need uh, no longer uh, motivates. Uh, so um, you have to uh, satisfy the need. If it is fully satisfied, you cannot motivate that person with that need. You're going to motivate him with the next uh, need, but the need will not be fully uh, gratified or it, it will not be fully satisfied. But if the person gets the level of satisfaction that is okay with him, you're going to motivate him with the next level of satisfaction. Recently, uh, there is a sixth need uh, that have been uh, proposed uh, for the highest level, Khalis, which is called the intrinsic uh, values, uh, which have been originated uh, from Maslow, uh, but uh, it has yet uh, gained uh, widespread uh, acceptance, which is the intrinsic needs. Uh, the intrinsic needs uh, actually, يعني, it's uh, something uh, totally new. Uh, people are accepting the idea that uh, uh, intrinsic uh, needs is something uh, uh, important. Uh, these are the, the true or the actual needs that uh, the people uh, try to reach, uh, but uh, this is not uh, uh, the, um, the main uh, theory that was developed by Maslow. It is some modification that uh, has been done to the theory. Uh, the second theory of the early uh, theories of motivation, uh, which is the two-factor theory. Uh, this theory um, uh, contrasted uh, two types of uh, factors inside the organization. The first is called the hygiene factors, and the second is called the motivational factors. Uh, I want to give you an example uh, to simplify things. Think about when you go uh, to your classroom and you find the classroom is clean uh, and there is air condition inside the classroom and uh, um, uh, your uh, professor is treating you in a nice way and uh, there is a power uh, a projector for uh, presenting uh, your uh, the 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 work for you uh, with the doctor uh, and uh, we uh, everyone is treating you in a friendly way uh, the policies are good the payment for um, for your courses is, is okay is affordable and everything is okay for you you're feeling secure in your place are you going to be satisfied for finding these things inside your classroom think about it no you know why? Because this is normal. This is normal to find your classroom clean. This is normal to find your professor treating you well. It's normal to find a, 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 a data show inside your class. It's normal to find air condition. It's normal to be treated uh, good by your colleagues and by your professor. It's normal that you pay uh, uh, adequate amount of money for your courses. So these factors are called the hygiene factors. These are the essential things that must be available inside your uh, job okay if you find these factors in your job you are going to be not dissatisfied but if these things are not available 
you are going to be dissatisfied. Think, if you enter the classroom and you find it dirty, you're going to shout, what's this? The classroom is dirty. If you find the air condition is not working, oh, it's too hot today, what's wrong? We need the air condition. If someone treated you badly, you're going to come to the um, whoever uh, responsible uh, about your uh, program and tell him, uh, so um, X uh, t treated me in a bad way. So if these conditions or these factors are not present, you are going to be dissatisfied. But if these conditions are present, it is normal for you. So you will not be dissatisfied. But this does not count to your satisfaction. Look at the other side. If you are an employee inside the company and your company offers you promotional opportunity, you know that if you work well, you're going to have a promotion. As for you, if you, st you studied well, you're going to travel for uh, 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 another country to continue to your study. We are going to take you to for internship in the summer in a very good company, multinational company. So this is promotional opportunities. Uh, maybe we're, we're going to give the, the excellent students opportunities for personal growth. We're going to give you uh, extra training and so and so. Recognition, you're going to be recognized by other people. Responsibility, you're going to give you responsibility, achievement. If you find these factors inside your job, you are going to be satisfied. Oh, my job is a very good one. But if these factors are missing, you are not satisfied. So the motivational factors are the factors that if they are present, you're going to be satisfied. If they are not present, you are not satisfied. But the hygiene factors, the essential factors are not satisfactory. They are not lead to uh, your satisfaction. So when we want to motivate our employees, motivate them with the motivational factors. Don't motivate the employees with the hygiene factors. I'm not going to motivate the students to tell them, I'm going to treat you well. I have to treat you well. I'm going to motivate you to tell you if you achieve a better uh, or a good GP, high GPA, I'm going to take you uh, to attend an internship in a multinational company. If you achieve high GPA, I'm going to take you to study abroad in the USA, for example. So these are the motivational factors. So, uh, but I'm not going to motivate you that if you are going to get a good or a high GPA, I'm going to let you uh, stay in a clean classroom. This is ridiculous. Okay? So, so this is the the concept of the two-factor theory by Hertzberg. The traditional view, it was satisfaction is the opposite of dissatisfaction. This was the traditional view. Hertzberg view, he said that we have two factors, motivators, which says satisfaction is the opposite of no satisfaction, and the hygiene factors no satisfaction is the opposite of dissatisfaction, as I told you in the previous slide. So, uh, to sum up, hygiene factors are those factors were not met lead to job dissatisfaction. But when they are met, they do not lead to job satisfaction, but lack of dissatisfaction. So, they don't lead to motivation. They don't lead to job, don't motivate your work, your, the, your workers, by the hygiene factors. Hygiene factors include quality of supervision, pay, company policies, physical work conditions, relations with other people, and job security. On the other side, motivational factors. They are the, reward, the rewarding factors in the work environment, like what? Like giving promotions, like personal growth opportunities, recognition, responsibility, achievement. Meeting these factors is going to increase motivation by creating satisfying work environment, okay? Uh, the criticism of uh, Hertzberg theory, uh, first that uh, the real reliability of this method uh, is under question. Uh, they said that it's not a very accurate method of measuring uh, job satisfaction and uh, motivation inside the workplace. And uh, there is no uh, measure of the overall satisfaction uh, 
uh, used uh, in that theory. But regardless of its criticism, uh, this theory had been widely used uh, and uh, Few uh, managers are unfamiliar with its recommendations and many of the managers inside the workplace uh, uses uh, this uh, theory. Uh, the third theory uh, is uh, MacLennan's uh, theory of needs. Uh, this uh, theory focuses on three needs. First is the need for achievement, second the need for power, and the third one is the need for affiliation. Uh, the need uh, for achievement is the drive to excel, uh, to achieve in relation to set of standards, to strive to succeed. People, uh, they want to achieve something, they want to succeed, they want to excel, uh, they have a set of standards, so they are trying to do their best in order to achieve uh, the goals or the things they want to achieve. The second one is the need for power. Uh, the need to make others behave in a way that they won't uh, have behaved otherwise. It's uh, to make uh, you have the power over people to let them do uh, special things that they wouldn't have do this unless you have that power on them. The third one is the need for affiliation. Uh, desire for friendly and close interpersonal uh, relationship, affiliation means intimate, so the desire to have a friendly atmosphere and good interpersonal relationship with other people, okay? So uh, uh, people have three needs, either to achieve something, they have goals they want to achieve, or they have need for power, they want to uh, have power over other people, uh, they want to uh, make people behave uh, in a different way that they want to behave, and the third is the need for affiliation, they want friendly atmosphere, they want close interrelationship with other people. This theory uh, had uh, the best support, but unfortunately, uh, practical-wise, uh, it doesn't have the same effect uh, as the other theories. Why? Uh, because Magland argued that the three needs are in our subconscious. Uh, we may rank high uh, in the three uh, needs, either achievement, power, or affiliation, but we don't know that we have that high ranking. I, mean, I might need uh, high achievement, but uh, I don't know that uh, I have that need, or I might need uh, have high need for power, or I might have high need for affiliation, but this is in my subconscious. I don't really know that I have this need. So, because of this, measuring them is not something easy. That's why, practically, uh, this uh, theory uh, doesn't have uh, that popularity like the other two uh, theories. Uh, there are other contemporary theories of motivation we're going to study. Uh, the three uh, theories that we're going to study are the reinforcement theory, expectancy theory, and equity and organizational uh, justice uh, theory. The first uh, theory is called the reinforcement theory. Uh, this theory states that behavior is a function of its consequences, which means that the person is going to uh, take certain behavior uh, according to the consequences of that behavior. Yani if I know that, if I do so, this is going to happen, so I'm, not, I'm going to do that behavior. If I'm, do, I'm going to do a bad behavior and I'm going to be punished, so I'm not going to do that behavior. So uh, this uh, theory states that uh, the person is going to uh, do certain behavior if he knows uh, what are the consequences of that behavior and accordingly he or she will choose the behavior that will lead him or her to uh, the consequences that he wants to reach. Uh, reinforcement uh, determines the behavior the, the people want to uh, reach and the behavior is something environmentally caused. So uh, by that we can say that goal setting is something uh, cognitive. Uh, the individual, uh, uh, the individual's uh, purpose uh, direct his or her action. So you have to decide what's your purpose and according to your purpose, uh, you are going to choose the behavior uh, uh, that uh, will 
take you or will lead you to reach your purpose. So, uh, inside your mind, it's something cognitive. Cognitive, which means, as I told you before, marifa or idrak. So, you're going to think about uh, what is going to lead you uh, to your purpose. And accordingly, you're going to choose the behavior that is going to, to, uh, to take you or to lead you towards your goal, setting your goals. Apparent conditioning uh, theory. Uh, this theory uh, states that people learn to behave to get something they want or avoid something they don't want. For example, if you do something wrong, I'm going to punish you. You do this thing again, I'm going to punish you. You won't do this thing a third time. If you do something good, I'm going to reward you. So you're going to do that good behavior in order to take that reward. So people learn to behave to get something they want or to avoid something they, they don't want. This is what we call behaviorism, a theory that behavior follows stimuli in relatively unthinking matter. You're not going to think, you know, that if you do this, you're going to be punished. If you do the good behavior, you're going to be rewarded. So you're not going to think you're going to avoid the bad behavior that will lead you to punishment and you are going to do the good behavior that you are going to be rewarded. I'm sorry for using that example, but think about the dogs. How we train the dogs to uh, do good things and bad things by giving them treats or good food that they love. When they do good things, you're going to reward the dog with the nice food they love. When they do bad things, we're going to punish the dog or uh, do... Uh, 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 punish him or you, you might not talk to him or to the dog and so on. So by time, the dog will do the good things to take the treats and will not do the bad things not to be punished. This is exactly the behavior is, but if it is uh, done on uh, human beings. Uh, social learning theory, uh, this is, uh, we can learn through both observation and direct experience. When we uh, learn, uh, people can learn through two things, by observing and by uh, through experience from your work. Uh, there are four processes uh, to determine the influence on uh, individuals. Uh, when you want uh, to learn, if there are four models to learn from. The first we call attentional uh, model or attentional process. People learn from model only when you recognize and pay attention to the critical features. So if uh, you are inside of something and you pay attention to that thing uh, very good and you understand your, its critical features, so you are now learning through the attentional process. You paid attention to that uh, uh, thing you are trying to learn and you understood its critical features. So this is what we call attentional process. The second model is called retention process. This model influence, uh, it depends on how the individual remember the model action after it is no longer readily available. So you are introduced to new model and you understood it very, very well, and then the, the model is no longer appear. Do you remember what was the model and what are the actions after the model that is not uh, here anymore? If you can re retention or you can remember what was the model, this is the retention process. The third one is called motor reproduction process. This is after the person seen the new behavior and you observe the model, uh, watching must be converted into doing. So you are introduced to new model, you understood it very well, so go and practice what you understood. Go on and go on and try to do what you understood in your practical life. This is the motor reproduction process. The fourth one is called reinforcement process, which uh, stress on that people or individuals are motivated to exhibit the behavior if there is positive in incentives or rewarded are provided. I'm going to follow that model if you are going to give me positive reward or positive in incentive to do so and so. So there are four models in the social learning theory. The first is attention. If you are going to pay uh, good attention to the critical features. The second is retention. If you can uh, retrieve or memorize what happened after this model is no longer available. The third is motor reproduction process is that after uh, understanding the model, you're going to do it in your practical life. And the fourth is 
reinforcement process that you are going to be motivated to do this work if the model is going to offer you uh, some rewards or incentives. Uh, the second theory is the expectancy theory. Uh, it is one of the most widely accepted uh, theories of uh, motivation. Um, this theory um, explains that um, anyone has a tendency to act in a certain way. Uh, this depends on his or her expectation that uh, his behavior will be followed by a given outcome, and that outcome is attractive uh, to uh, him or her. So I'm going to um, do certain behavior or I'm going to uh, um, move uh, or uh, I'm going to um, act in a certain way uh, according to uh, the outcome that uh, is going to uh, get out of my work and whether that outcome is attractive to me or not. Uh, employees uh, will be motivated to exert uh, effort when they believe that uh, the effort they are going to exert will lead to good performance, appra good, uh, performance appraisal, and this, will, uh, this performance appraisal will lead to organizational reward, and this reward will satisfy their goals. So, uh, this is the main uh, uh, concern about or the main explanation of this theory. So, this theory has three main links. First link is between the effort and the performance. People are going to exert high effort if they believe that this effort is going to lead to a high uh, individual performance evaluation. And uh, if the individual performance is going to lead to high organizational reward, this is the second link. The third link is that if the organizational reward is going to uh, uh, match or it's going to lead to uh, uh, high personal goals to that person. So uh, I'm going to exert effort if I know that this is going to lead to a high individual performance, uh, if the performance will lead to organizational reward, and if the organizational reward is going to satisfy my personal goals, so I'm going to exert effort. Otherwise, I'm not going to exert any effort. Uh, this theory helps to explain why a lot of workers, they are not motivated and they do minimum work because they believe that their effort it will not lead to uh, the goals they want to reach. So they are not going to exert high effort. Uh, so there are three main questions employees need to answer uh, if their motivation is to be maximized. First question, if I give my maximum effort, it will, be, it will be recognized in my performance appraisal. If I exert the maximum I can do in my work, is this going to be shown in my performance appraisal? The second question, if I get good performance appraisal or high performance appraisal, will it lead to organizational rewards? Are they going to reward me inside the organization? So, and then the third question, if I am rewarded, are these the rewards that I want to, I want, I'm reaching, I'm searching for, are these rewards attractive for me? If the three questions have positive answers for the employee, he or she are going to exert the maximum effort. Otherwise, you're not going to exert any effort. They are going to exert the minimum effort that is going to keep them working inside the organization. Uh, the third uh, theory, which is the equity theory, uh, which states that uh, employees weigh uh, what they put into a job situation, uh, their inputs, uh, example of the inputs is the effort we put into our job, uh, our experience, our education, our confidence, and so on. Uh, we weigh this uh, inputs against what the uh, employees get uh, from the job, uh, the outcomes, outcomes uh, like salaries, like uh, raises, like recognition. So, uh, employees compare uh, their input over output ratio with the input uh, to uh, output or outcome ratio of the relevant others. 
So, uh, for example, I can compare my input uh, to outcome ratio to the input to, to outcome ratio of my colleagues or other people outside my field to see whether it's fair or not. Uh, comparison employees make of their job inputs, as I told you, effort, experience, education, confidence, and the outcomes, which are salaries, raises, recognition, relative to the inputs and outcome of other employees. When they see that the income to output of the employee are equal to the input uh, uh, over output of the others inside my field or my colleagues or outside my field, there is a state of equity exists. There is no tension as the, the situation is considered fair. I compared my effort I exert, uh, my experience, my education, my confidence uh, over the salary I'm paid, the raises and recognition. I compared this ratio to the same ratio of my colleague and I found that we are nearly equal, equal. so I felt that we are uh, uh, in a fair situation, there is a state of equity exists. What happens when the ratios are in unequal? For example, I compared my input to outcome ratio uh, to my colleagues' inputs to outcome ratio and I found them unequal. There is tension exists. I feel there is unfairness inside our company. Unfairness might be one of two. It might be under rewarded state that I feel that I'm under rewarded. My ratio is lower than my colleague. So I feel angry. I am under rewarded. They are giving him more salary compared to mine. He is doing less effort than my effort. So sometimes when the, my ratio is less than others ratio, I feel that I am under rewarded and I feel angry. So what about if this is the opposite? I make the ratio and I found that I am over rewarded. I take more than my colleagues. I found that the input to outcome ratio my in input to outcome ratio is greater than my colleagues. I feel that I'm over rewarded, so I feel guilty. I feel that I take more than my colleagues. So sometimes you feel guilty. So when you feel tension, either you are under rewarded or over rewarded, this motivates people to act to bring their situation into equity. They want to go to the equity state, uh, status where your, uh, your uh, ratio is equal to your colleague's ratio. So this is the ratio I'm talking to you about. Look at the first one. Output over input of A. A is you uh, or the employee and B is your colleague or the others. So if the output over input of the employee is less than the output over input of the others. So there is inequity due to being under rewarded. You feel that you are angry because you are not given like other people. There is, uh, uh, you feel angry. The other, the second situation where the output over input of the employee is equal to the output over input of the others in the company. So there is a state of equity and you feel that it's okay and uh, you feel that the company is fair. The third situation where the output over input of the employee is greater than the output over input of the others. Here, there is a state of inequity due to being over rewarded and here you feel guilt, okay? So you want to reach a situation where my output Output over my input equal your output over your input. So when employees perceive an inequity, either by, uh, it is uh, over rewarded or under rewarded, they can uh, predict to make one of six choices in order to reach the equity state. What they can do? They can change the input. How they can change the input? For example, they can exert less or more effort. So my effort is in my hand. I can exert less effort or I can exert more effort so I can change my input in order to uh, become in a balanced state with my colleagues. Uh, 
The second, I can change the outcome. How can I change the outcome? For example, some increases are paid on the piece rate. So, I can increase the quantity while decrease the quality. So, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, take care that all the, the pieces I'm producing are with very good quali quality. I'm going to do uh, the work not very carefully, but I'm going to increase the quantity of work so that my output is going to be increased. The third one is the distort perception of self. Mean, I realize I can... I can talk to myself. I can tell myself I realize that I work harder than everyone. So I can start to talk that I know that I work harder than everyone. So uh, I, I deserve that. Start to distort the perception of self so that you can bring the, uh, the equity in your uh, ratio. Number four, disturb, uh, distort perception of other. Uh, you can say that X job is not desirable as I thought. So you can start distorting the perception of other people. No, his, his job was not desirable as I thought. No, my job was better. So you are going to rethink about the, the balancing of the equation. Number five, do choose a different reference. I may, not, uh, I may not make as much money as X, but I'm doing a lot better than Y. Why you are choosing X as a reference? Choose another person, choose another one. Why I am comparing myself to my co that colleague? Compare with another colleague. It might bring you this uh, uh, balance that you won't reach. Number six, if you cannot do all of this, leave the field, quit the job in order to reach satisfaction. Uh, the organizational justice theory uh, is the overall perception of what is fair in the workplace. Uh, example is that when the employee think that uh, it is a fair place to work at. In order to reach organizational justice, uh, there must be uh, distributive justice, procedural justice, and interactional justice inside the organization. When the three uh, forms of justice are present inside the organization, we can say that there is organizational justice uh, where the employees think that this is a fair place to work as they have overall perception that um, uh, this is a fair uh, workplace. So let's uh, see what is meant by distributive procedural and interactional justice. Uh, distributive uh, the justice is the perceived fairness of outcome, which means that uh, when they are uh, going to uh, um, when they are going to distribute the outcome uh, on employees, they are going to be fair in uh, the outcome given to uh, the employees. So this is what they call distributive justice. Example: I got the pay raise I deserve. The second type, which is called procedural justice. Uh, procedural justice means perceived fairness of the process used to determine the outcome. What are the process used uh, in distributing that outcome? What are uh, the rules that are um, followed in order to uh, 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 distribute that outcome? What are the process that is used to uh, distribute that outcome? Example, I had input into the process used to give raises and was given a good explanation what I received, uh, why I received the raise I did. So people understand who was given that amount and for what reason. The third uh, type of justice, which is called interactional justice. Um, interactional justice uh, means sensitivity to the quality of interpersonal treatment, which means people are treated in a good manner inside the organization. Example, when telling me about my raise, my supervisor was very nice and uh, complimentary. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to uh, to say this in Arabic. Uh, don't tell your employees, Tfadal <laughs> Sidi, this is what you are going to take. I'm giving you this uh, from me, Shafaqa. No, 
this is his right to take the raise. His, this is his right to take the reward. So uh, you have to be very polite uh, when giving uh, raise or giving reward to your uh, employees. So organizational justice, it is fairness in the workplace. Uh, it is how employees fare that they are treated uh, uh, and the decisions uh, are taken fairly inside the organization. Uh, as we said, it is uh, composed of three types of justice. The first one is the distributive justice. It's concerned with the fairness of the outcomes, like the pay and recognitions uh, the employees receive. The second one uh, is the procedural uh, justice. Um, procedural uh, justice uh, has uh, to do with how decisions are made uh, or um, uh, how uh, people uh, took certain powers or how uh, the, the, the rewards are distributed over employees. Uh, they have to know uh, what are the rules that are followed inside the organization to do so and so. What are the rules for uh, empowering some employees? What are the rules uh, that are followed to give some rewards to other employees and so on? So this is what we call the procedural justice. The third type, which is called interactional justice, uh, employees, uh, here employees uh, care about two types of fairness. Uh, the first one is called informational justice, uh, whether the managers provide employees with explanation for the decision and they are informed with important manners inside the organization. Employees have to understand what is happening. They have to keep, they, they have to know all the relevant information regard, regarding their organization. They have to be uh, updated with all the info, needed information. Uh, the second one is interpersonal justice. Uh, which means that employees are treated with dignity and respect. As I told you, uh, we have to respect uh, our employees and not to treat them badly inside the organization. So uh, what is the justice uh, outcome? Uh, all the types of justice we discussed, uh, they are linked together uh, to uh, bring uh, employees uh, working uh, in a fair organization. If they feel that they are working in a fair organization, they are going to uh, perform well, so they will have high performance and uh, the citizenship, citizen, citizenship behavior is going to increase. Uh, third part is or observer reaction to injustice is substational. If you see uh, if you are working in an organization and you can see that there is injustice, even if you are not the person that is exposed to this injustice, you are going to have a bad reaction. So, uh, in any organization, try to uh, not to be uh, unjust, uh, not to uh, treat anyone with injustice. Uh, try to be fair to everyone inside the organization. So if you are treating even one person in unfair manner, the others, the third parties or the observers of this unfairness, they are going to have a bad reaction for the, your organization. Uh, job engagement uh, can be defined as um, investing the employee's uh, physical, cognitive, and emotional energy uh, into job performance. Uh, so the employee is doing all his best in order to enhance or in order to improve his job performance. So in that way, the we can say that this employee is engaged in his or her job. Uh, academic studies show that uh, when employees are engaged in their uh, job, uh, uh, this is positively associated with high job performance and, of course, uh, employee citizenship behavior. So, um, uh, companies are trying uh, to uh, let employees have high job engagement so that they can have um, uh, high performance and, as a result, uh, employee citizenship behavior. Uh, last thing we can say uh, is that what makes people more engaged in their job? 
Uh, we have uh, three things that makes people more engaged. First is the degree to which the employee believes that uh, it is me meaningful to engage in the work. He thinks that uh, this work is meaningful to him. He feels that uh, he is doing something that is important to him. So he is doing uh, uh, or he is putting all his effort, either physical, cognitive and emotional uh, effort in order to provide or to perform well inside his job. So uh, according to uh, uh, the meaning uh, or he believes in the meaning of the engagement of that work, he is going to put that or exert that effort. The second is the match between the individual value and the organizational value. If he believes that the organization have the same values as his or her values, he's going to exert that much effort, he's going to engage as he is uh, um, moving towards achieving the same goals in the organization as his own goals, because this organization have the same values as his or her values. Third, leadership behavior that inspire workers to great sense of a mission. It depends on the leaders. The leaders in the company, they they have inspiration for the workers. They they give the workers the sense that they have a, a great mission. They are doing a great work, that they are doing something no one else can do this. So from the, the high level of motivation that the leaders give the, uh, the employees, uh, employees feel that they are engaged in their job. So uh, a, a big part uh, lies um, on uh, leaders. Leaders uh, can motivate employees to the extent that the, uh, the, the employees become motivated uh, and become engaged in their jobs. Uh, this part, uh, implications for managers, is for reading. You have to read this part and also this slide for reading. You will find some uh, MCQ questions uh, after studying well this chapter. Try to uh, solve these questions. Uh, and you, if you need anything, uh, feel free to contact me on my email. Thank you and good luck, my dear friends.